Welcome to the Procurement Conversation, where we talk to industry leaders about the hottest topics in procurement. This week, we're joined by Richard Jameson, Head of Procurement and Properties at Grant Thornton, UK. Hi, Rich. How are you doing? Yeah, good. So yeah, just talk us through your background. How did you get into procurement and what's your current role? Yeah, so my background, I've been mostly in manufacturing. So I spent 20 years working in manufacturing businesses, um, so five years in IT at Peugeot Citroen as a grad. Then uh, after having get up, fed up with that, to be honest, I ended up working for my father in law for five years. Very different SME, uh, traveling the world, took me to India for the first time to sell precast concrete machinery. So not what you'd expect from a, a procurement person now, but actually that time in, in sales kind of really helped me as well in, in my role today because it helps me understand those account managers a bit better. Um, and then from there, because of the sales and the fact I'd been doing some procurement work for them, I managed to transition to JLR. Um, where they were setting up a team managing complex supply chains to India. So it's affecting my India experience and I think my sales experience that actually got me into procurement. And it was not intentional. It was purely standing on the steps of a friend who I said, oh, slightly frustrated with work. And he said, well, I'm losing most of my team to Jagger Land Rover. Why don't you go and have a look? They seem to be having a, a lot of rails going. So that's what I did. And procurement seemed to be about the only one that I could fit into with my sales and the India experience. And I suppose the rest is history, really. That's what I've been doing for the last kind of just over a decade now. Um, you know, I got to live in India when I was working at Jaguar Land Rover. I then went into software procurement for the vehicle at Jaguar Land Rover. Um, and then, yeah, just under two years ago, transitioned to, to Grant Thornton. Um, and I suppose what took me into that was probably my, the fact that if you look at the last 15 years, every role I've had, hasn't had a job description and I've had to go in and effectively shape it, see what the business needs and then shape it on that. You know, somebody's thought we need, we know we need a role here, we know roughly what it is, but we don't know exactly what it is. We need somebody to come in, figure it out, shape it and take it forward. Um, and, you know, all three of my roles as a Jaguar Land Rover, although it's a very mature company, were like that. Uh, and that's kind of really put me in good stead from what I'm doing at Grant Thornton, which is setting up a procurement team. So that's the brief, set up procurement. And it doesn't necessarily mean centralized procurement. It just means set up procurement. You know, how are we going to do procurement better as an organization? Um, and yeah, and then a few months ago, I've been doing kind of all the right things in procurement and lucky enough to now be responsible for property as well. You know, there's quite a lot of overlap between property and procurement. It's about building relationships. It's about commerciality. And it's a big part of ESG as well. So kind of because I'm driving ESG on the procurement side, we need to do that on the property side as well. So it means I'm now responsible for, you know, all of scope three and then a large part of scope one and two as well. So, you know, huge amount there to kind of get your head around really. I'm interested in your, your journey from transitioning from a, an IT role into a procurement role. And yeah. how did that background in IT influence your approach uh, to procurement? Yeah, I mean, it was actually that background in IT that got me my last job at Jaguar Land Rover. Um, mm. So I was coming back from India without really a role to move back to. And one of my old bosses knew somebody that was kind of leading one of the tech teams where, again, the, kind of, there was a handful of people where they were looking at really growing it. And one of the things they really struggled with was finding internal people at JLR that knew software and knew it well. And therefore, the fact that I had been programming for three years and it was Kerbal Kicks DB2, which is very old, <laughs> Uh, but I'd also, you know, managed data centers and been on call in data centers. So I kind of understood the actual work on the ground from those that really helped me move into that role and really helped me be able to have level conversations, not just with the suppliers, but I think with the engineers as well. I think, you know, from an engineering perspective, um, they want to be able to talk to somebody in procurement that really knows what they're talking about. Um, so it's, um, you know, and having that, knowledge really helps you have all having kind of level conversations with people really um so it was massively beneficial to know it and really that's put me in good stead now it's opened my doors with stakeholders at grant thornton you know every department has got a SaaS platform of some sort whether it's recruitment whether it's marketing and being able to support them on their SaaS contracts suddenly means that you get a step in you get a foot in it in you can demonstrate to them what you can do and how you can help them on what is actually typically not necessarily a large-scale contract, 
but then you can help them with everything else as well. Grant Thornton UK is a, is a greenfield procurement function. Uh, so what strategies have you implemented to build relationships with those key stakeholders? Uh, and yeah, how do you engage with them to understand their objectives? Yeah, I guess it's just, you know, walking the floor and I suppose the virtual floor as it is today, you, know, you can't, can't actually get around the office as much anymore. But I just made sure I kind of got around and talked to everybody. I didn't really say to them, this is what you need to do initially. It's just finding out about them as individuals, finding about their past. There's some very long serving people at Grant Thornton, which means there's a wealth of knowledge here. Um, you know, I'm not going to teach them how to run their business, but it's how kind of help them make even better decisions going forward. So, you know, certainly the first few months, it was just having conversations with people, meeting people. And I think getting to know all those people from the different areas helps you understand other areas as well, um, because you kind of get a complete picture of the business, really. So the first three to four months, I was kind of under the radar, to be honest. I didn't really, I wasn't really trying to do any procurement as such. Um, and that was fine with my boss. She was great. She kind of gave me the space for that. You know, I joined in the August and it wasn't until December that I actually presented to the board, right, well, this is what I think the target operating model needs to be like. And this is what we need to do in the next three to five years to get there effectively. Um, and I think that kind of not jumping in straight away not trying to not trying to make an impact straight away, but listening, being in that listening mode, that understanding really helped, I suppose, build better relationships where they kind of knew I wasn't just jumping in straight away and trying to have an impact and trying to make loads of noise just to impress my boss. It was more about actually I really am trying to help them and understand them more. Yeah, I mean that, that can be quite difficult, especially in the greenfield where Yeah you've got your playbook you've got things that worked in another organization but it could be i mean it might even be in, obviously for you it's a very different <laughs> sector so it, it yeah, be yeah very different anyway but yeah you even see people in the same sectors and it's it's like actually there, there's there's very different approaches there's, there's different understandings within the business different levels of commerciality so it's yeah definitely one way you've got to you've got to listen and understand before you before you sort of wade in there yeah for sure definitely what role do you think technology is playing in procurement today yeah i mean it's <laughs> Obviously, it's a key point that everybody's talking about, and I think it really depends on the organisation. You know, if you're a very large-scale organisation, there's definitely a huge need for it. Although, conversely, some large organisations haven't actually got the access to the right data for procurement for category managers to be able to make those decisions. So it's kind of a real, but yet they have massive kind of complex ERPs that should be able to give them that, but it's not always available how you want it. And then at the smaller end of the scale. It's a really hard one because for me, if I had the right digital solutions, I'd probably need less resource. But when you look at the cost of some of these solutions, you're like, well, do I have a technical solution or do I have a person that can build relationships? You know, what is going to have the most impact right now? Um, and you kind of have to really think about that. Now, equally, technology has become far simpler as well. You know, and I guess we all used to kind of operate in Excel. And everybody kind of criticizes that, which I do understand. But there's things that you can take kind of Excel and make it more complex to slightly closer to a SaaS solution. You've got Microsoft lists, you can then use Power Apps to do to create tasks and set reminders and send emails. And you're almost kind of creating your own platform. And the, the benefit of that is you're actually writing your requirements for when you do need a, a technology platform. Because the problem is there's so many platforms out there. You know, you attend all these webinars talking about all these products. Well, which one's right for me? There's a hundred there. How do I know which one is going to fix what I want? And none of them are going to fix it all. So actually, you kind of need a suite of things. And suddenly you're going to tell somebody, oh, well, I need 50K here, 50K there. You know, and suddenly it kind of adds up, adds up. And you're like, well, actually, what am I trying to do? Am I trying to create a digital world? Am I trying to build relationships with my stakeholders to help them make better decisions? So um, I think in the right place, it's absolutely needed. You know, if you look at third party risk management, for example, the only way you can really do that well is by using a tool that's going to do, go and do a load of data mining and kind of really just gather a huge amount of data from lots of data points and put it in a simple dashboard to say, right, this is what you need to look at. But on other side of things, you know, do I, for example, need an RFP sourcing tool? Absolutely not. We don't do enough RFPs in the year. And actually, because we're decentralized procurement, I'd suddenly have to teach everybody how to use a sourcing tool before they even kick their project out. 
there's no benefit. So it's kind of really thinking about for you as an organization, what works for you. You know, having come from a tech background, I absolutely see the benefits. Um, you know, and I even played around in chat GPT the other day just to kind of see, I kind of just asked it some questions, right? Well, if I was going to go and buy professional services, what are the things I should consider as a, as a procurement person? And actually the answer came back really well. And that if you think kind of using the technology from that perspective, for a junior person in your organization who you're trying to teach the skill of procurement, the old days you'd have to spend hours on Google or just kind of sitting with people, talking to them about it. Just very quickly, they can kind of start to upskill themselves by using those sort of things. So think, well, well, okay, does that make sense? And then instead of just having to research it themselves, they take that and to take it to somebody more senior and say, does this make sense? This is what I found out. And you're like, yeah, absolutely. So it's going from a position of knowing nothing to something very quickly and then be able to say, does it make sense or not by validating it with the real world person or not necessarily kind of trusting AI uh, implicitly. So there's definitely a huge amount of technology benefits that procurement can leverage, but it's got to be right for you as an organization. Yeah, I think, I think the benefit really is to, to automate some of that less uh, value adding work, administrative, yeah. tactical, tactical type work. And then, yeah, you can focus more on the, the more strategic work, more on building relationships with your stakeholders yeah. and suppliers, which is where, where we add the most value, I think, as a, as a function. And I think, you know, part of that is stakeholders don't have data. And that's why they make bad decisions sometimes. It's not because they intend to. It's because they don't have the data. They don't have the visibility of their spend, for example. But they don't know that Joe over there is also buying from that same supplier than you are. So, but equally, a lot of those dashboards within kind of procurement SaaS tools are just Tableau and Power BI in the background. So it's actually very easy for you to do that yourself, as long as you've got the base data within a, you know, within an ERP to be able to do that. Luckily enough for me, I do have that. So it's, a, but, but not everybody has, you know, not everybody Greenfield procurement function even have an ERP system to be able to get that data. We've got on your team. What, what's your management philosophy? It's, I mean, the foundation is, has to be trust. You know, I've I kind of, I've always had small teams, kind of six or seven people, um, which is great because then you can kind of know your teams more. I've never had a huge team to manage, which then becomes a different approach you have to take. But certainly when it's a small team, it's got to be foundation as trust. And, you know, I guess just before this, before we started recording, I was talking about, you know, setting the vision for the team and how they can operate within that. Um, you know, I've been lucky enough to work for people that really trusted me in my day job and what I was doing and didn't get involved in it. It was just like, yeah, you know what you're doing, crack on and do it. But there were certain stages where they also made it clear, well, actually, we need to be getting over here and therefore, how are you going to do what you're doing to get to that point? And that's the important thing for individuals to feel they can really make a contribution. You've got to say to them, All right, well, what are my values as an individual and how do I want to set the values of the team and procurement across the firm they can operate within the that framework um, and then trust them to kind of go on and do that really and be there to support them yeah i think i think empowering your people is is massively important isn't it and and as well having that understanding that people will they are learning they will make mistakes yeah and yet yeah you just got to back them up when they do and as long as it's not too drastic it's uh it's just part of that learning experience yeah i mean on that you know and on that backing up point very early on in my career as a grad one of my directors said to me after I'd had an incident in the middle of the night, and I wasn't quite sure about what I was doing because I had only been in the organization a few months. She just said to me, if you can justify to me why you made that decision in that moment, I will back you up 100%. Now, we might then look at that decision and help you realize why, well, next time maybe think of this or next time maybe do that. But if you can demonstrate you've been through the steps to think about why you've said yes or why you've said no to that, then you're fine. And I think it's making people understand that, that just think about what you're doing, work it through, analyze it, make a decision, and there is no wrong decision. Because in that moment, you know, somebody is always going to be able to make a better decision in the future based on what's already happened. Yeah, and therefore, don't judge yourself for having made a, a bad decision because it could have turned out good but it just happens to have turned out bad for a reason that maybe you didn't foresee as long as you've thought about it. It's making the team understand that as well. How do you create a coaching environment in your business? I mean, I think overall as a business, 
we're very strong on coaching anyway. I think we're one of the very few companies in the UK where you can actually get coaching qualification doing the company's training. Um, you know, and I think that's the nature of our business being a people business uh, and effectively selling knowledge and people. That's what we do. So the investment in people at the organization is huge. And I think the values of the organization are great. And there's also a really strong secondment kind of opportunity across the firm. And I think that always comes from that kind of coaching of, right, well, where do you want to be in life? Where do you want to get to? And how are we going to help you get a better version of you so that um, so you can be more effective in what you do? You know, where do you, where do you want to get to? And how are we going to help you on that? And it's kind of really that, that investment in people at the firm that then has made me realize, right, well, how how do I kind of shape that and use that kind of coaching ability to help stakeholders as well? It's not about telling a stakeholder what they should be doing. Stakeholders tell you what they think you want to know. What they don't tell you is what they do know that might be important to help you set a strategy or to help you kind of guide them on something. You know, And I've had a few discussions recently where I talked to a stakeholder for 20 minutes about something, you think you've nailed it, and then you've just asked one little question and they've just shared something. And it's like, right, well, that's a completely different dimension to it now. I kind of understand what you're doing even more. And suddenly, and and whereas I've kind of sometimes gone from, oh, the powers maybe with the suppliers, suddenly just that one little nugget flips it on its head entirely. So it's really trying to teach the team that, to draw the most out of somebody that coaching approach is really going to help you be more effective. And I think the more you coach each other, the more you're going to get more naturally. You know, coaching is not an easy skill to do. And you have to invest time in kind of really, uh, in really developing that ability. You know, I'm, I'm a solutionizer. Come to me with a problem. I'll give you a solution. You know, and I think that's my manufacturing background. You know, you're taught in manufacturing. Here's a problem. How do you fix it? And you've got to fix it quickly which is very hard then, the more senior you get in organizations. <laughs> because typically people come to you with a problem and you just want to fix it. Whereas actually, you know they know the solution and you almost want to draw that solution out of them to kind of say, well, you know the solution. All you need to, all what you're really looking for is validation that your solution is the right one to go. Okay. And aside from coaching, how do you help your team members to develop other skills and knowledge in procurement? Yeah, I mean, it's... This is a new one we've just started exploring. So we've just gone from myself and a procurement manager to, to kind of four of us. And, and I think for me, one of the things I said to them all was, you know, if you look at life being a book and this being a particular chapter in that book, if you're lucky enough, you might meet across several chapters in that book. But if we're only going to be in this chapter, how are we going to help each other and grow each other within this chapter to help each other for our next chapter, whatever that might be. Um, you know, and I'm pretty clear to people, you're going to come and go. You know, you're not going to suddenly, we're, you know, gone are the days where you get a job and you work there for 35, 50 years and you kind of retire and that's it. You know, people don't do that in the same way anymore. Now, as it is, Grant Thornton has some people with a huge long service there, which is fantastic, but they've all moved around different roles within there. Um to help them grow and everything. So I think for me, it's about understanding where their ultimate goal is, where they want to get to. And if you understand that a lot more, it helps you realize what, what are the skills and what is the knowledge you're going to need to achieve that to be able to help you get there. Um, you know, for me, one of the things I'd quite like to do, for example, later on in my career, kind of in the kind of twilight years a bit more, is kind of work with the charity a lot more and, you know, maybe be on the board of a charity. So what I'm then doing to, as part of that, it's kind of doing a lot more CSR work here. And our CSR work here happens to be working with charities, helping charities or kind of going into school. There's a particular program I did called Rise recently uh, through the Talent Foundry. And all those things just help you as an individual. It doesn't necessarily help me in my procurement, but it helps me grow as an individual. It helps you get more comfortable as an individual and happier in your role. And if you're happy as a person, you'll do your day job a lot better as well. So it's not even just about your procurement skills. It's about what is the skills and knowledge that you want as an individual as a whole that will make you happy and balanced in life as an individual. Well, I think there's so many transferable skills into procurement as well. So even um, the CSR side, the charity side, getting involved in those sort of things, there's, there's definitely 
some soft skills, facilitation, yeah, communication, all those things, and they're all all applicable back into the role. In a few posts about sort of the emotional intelligence and that type yeah. of thing, and actually building that is a really uh, central part of, of developing as a procurement professional. Definitely, hundred percent. What advice would you give to someone who's considering a career in procurement? I mean, I guess there's, there's two routes to procurement right now. Mm. People start straight out of university uh, and kind of go straight into that. Although I'm not sure how they find out about it. So, and then others who kind of flip halfway through life. Now, certainly, mm. you know, I kind of mentioned Rise earlier. This is effectively where you go into a school and they just, kids help find out about what it is to, to work and what it is to be in a corporate environment. And even there, they're kind of saying, well, what's your job? And I was like, I buy stuff. Really. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I was like, I just buy stuff to help a company work. I was like, would you buy fashion at all? For example, some of them were saying, do you buy fashion? I said, no, I don't. But I do know people who have come from the fashion industry and have bought yeah. fashion. And you know what? Do you know what the great thing about the fashion industry? You often get to travel the world because a lot of the suppliers are overseas. Now, this was, you know, a school that was, you know, wasn't in the kind of a, uh, not the great socioeconomic background. And mm. suddenly these, these girls were sitting there kind of, and their eyes were like, wow, I could actually get a career in fashion. Yeah. buying something and traveling the world and suddenly just having those told those three girls well, this is something they could do even if they don't go into procurement it's making them think work isn't necessarily as dull as it might sound sound when you're a 14 15 year old sitting yeah. in school you know there are opportunities out there there's lots of things out there to think about so i think that's kind of one of the routes that's quite exciting is how do you get somebody early on to think about what a procurement profession might be but even somebody else who's looking at going to it later on in the career, there's lots of transferable skills. You know, for me, it was the sales aspect. For me, it happened to be working in a particular market like India. That, you know, there weren't many people that knew the Indian market that they could therefore kind of work with the Indian culture. Um, but I think it's understanding the fact that ultimately procurement is about relationships. Hmm. You know, because even negotiations are about relationships. Yeah, as much as you can see the opportunities within negotiation and the leveraging, unless you can build a good relationship very quickly with that person across the table, you're not going to get to a best outcome. Hmm. And it's kind of really understanding that actually, once you understand those stuff, the elements of procurement, that's when you get the most out of the world, really. You know, and for me, I just really enjoy dealing with people, meeting new people, understanding people's skills, understanding new just understanding new parts of the business overall. And I think that that's the exciting part of, the, of procurement really is that every business in the world needs to buy stuff to function. Hmm. And therefore the world is your oyster. You really can end up in any industry. You know, people do end up kind of going, oh, well, I'm buying IT and therefore that's what I'm staying in. But, you know, I was in complex supply chains, then ended up in software, and now I'm buying for a professional services firm, purely because of transferable skills of procurement looking ahead what what trends do you see in procurement and how do you believe they're going to impact the role of a procurement leader i mean i guess you know we talked about technology and digital i think it's going to remove a lot of that kind of tactical work and a lot of the data mining because it's going to present that in a way that we can get the value out of it but i think getting the value out of that data and then building those relationships with the stakeholders is something that's that i don't think technology is necessarily going to replace or not anytime soon anyway um so I think it's probably going back to the basics of those softer skills of building relationships, of coaching, and really kind of understanding what the business wants. You know, I remember seeing a presentation from the CPO of MNS at SIPS Futures this year, and he was talking about how he's very much trying to make procurement as business partners. You know, and that's the, you know, and in a way, it's moving away from that tick box and process driven side of things and moving more to a business partner how am i going to help you in your role and in your objectives and how am i going to help you meet your objectives as a function i'm not here to get in the way i'm not here to stop decisions i'm here to help you get there faster and have more confidence in what you're doing um, and i think that's where that maybe the softer skills of a procurement individual will start becoming even more important than they always have been Actually, I think they're going to have a different focus now because we're going to have more technology available there to do some of the more manual things. What's your biggest mistake and what did you learn? Uh, probably when I moved to India, to be honest, and 
uh, was helping to set up the team out there. You know, I'd I'd already been working on the India project for a, for a couple of years um, on my own, really, with with directions from our director. Um, and there weren't that many people that kind of knew what was happening in the Indian market. The team grew really fast there. And somebody said to me, one of my kind of leaders said, you know what needs to be done? Just go there and deliver it. Now, as much as I knew the Indian culture and had been traveling to India for six or seven years, I kind of just took that as an order. And right, I kind of cracked on because that's the type of individual I am. I hadn't really thought about the change journey that those teams had to go through to kind of learn what I'd learned over the last two years. I hadn't really thought about seniority and the fact that I wasn't the manager and there were other managers there and I was trying to tell them what to do. You know, and it did it did come ahead and it did cause friction in that moment. Now we all overcame it, you know, as a team and I think we came out stronger for it. You know, I was lucky enough that those individuals saw that it wasn't from a point of bad intention. It was I was trying to help the team to deliver, but I hadn't really thought about that change journey that people go through. You know, and you have to really take people through that change journey. And I think that's what's really stood me in good stead in my current role is I've now learned for that and realized don't push people too quickly. Although it might seem obvious to you, if it's not obvious to them, you've got to let them realize it and understand it and see it before you're trying to push them into that kind of space of change. Really. And which book changed your thinking about procurement? I mean, I suppose it's not really about procurement, although it really helped me in my procurement journey at the start of Grant Thornton. I happened to come across it. It's a book called uh, The Courage to be Disliked how to free yourself and change your life and achieve real happiness. Um, it's by a couple of Japanese authors. Um, and it's effectively trying to resurface Alfred Adler's thinking uh, of, uh, I suppose, that kind of nature versus nurture kind of element of it is that that actually Sigmund Freud was more around what's in the past does shape you as an individual, whereas Adler was a lot more about actually it doesn't. Um, but one of the things in that book was around, you know, it talks about what is your task and what is somebody else's task. And therefore, one of the things I had to learn when I joined Grant Thornton, there's so much to do, is that when should I say no? And as an individual, I'm very much a person of, you know, got to say yes all the time, got to please people. And that's, some people are like, I've you know, got to please everybody. But actually, it wasn't possible to do that when I'm on my own. Wasn't even, isn't even possible to do that when I've got a team of two or three. And therefore, knowing to say on certain things, yeah, I'm not going to do that. That's that person's task. I might help them do it. I might give them some guidance, but I've got to trust them based on that guidance. They've got to do that. And when are other things I've just got to say no to. And it just, it was happenstance. I came across it, um, looking through kind of books in Kindle that just happened to come up. And it just came at the right time for me when I was joining Grant Thornton and kind of really helped me realize I've got to think about what I'm trying to achieve a lot more and not necessarily trying to fix everybody else. Um, you know, it is quite a controversial title. I've kind of mentioned to a few people who say the courage to be disliked. That means you're not, you know, they want anybody to like you, but actually what it's trying to say is actually if you're happy in what you're doing, uh, one, you can change yourself, ignoring your past entirely. And two, you probably will have better relationships with other people anyway, if you think about, if you kind of take that. Because equally, if I was to say yes to everybody, then I wouldn't deliver for anybody as well. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing with procurement is it's, it's all about the right balance. Because I think in the past, there, there have been people who just enjoy blocking things and yeah. don't really care too much about whether they're being disliked. But then you don't want to swing completely the other way and just sort of we used to call it the sort of the stakeholder slave where you just sort of do everything that you're told yeah, by the exactly. stakeholder you, you definitely got to push back so we got critical friend you're sort of pushing back where necessary and giving some constructive challenge but not not blocking and not doing whatever you're told really exactly you know they've got to feel supported they've got to feel listened to you know people do need to when they have a conversation with you it doesn't mean you just stay flat no they do have to leave that conversation feeling or actually I've got maybe a nugget of advice I can go away with, or actually they've made me realize that what I'm doing is fine anyway, so I don't need their help. And I was thinking the right thing anyway. So it's just, yeah, it's kind of taking that view of, um, yeah, how can you kind of help somebody without necessarily doing the doing? What important truth about procurement do very few people agree with you on? 
I mean, when I look at people at Grant Thornton, I suppose it's it's the fact that it's it's easy in a way. I suppose they see it as this really complicated thing, and they kind of say, "I oh, know nothing about procurement." It's like, "Well, you do really," because every day in your life, you negotiate. You negotiate with your wife. You negotiate with your kids. You negotiate with your partner. You know, you might have a pet even. You end up negotiating with your pet because they want to do something versus what you're doing. So everybody in their life has to negotiate with somebody. The difference is, as procurement professionals, we probably do it more consciously than people who aren't, I suppose. So, um, you know, and that's what I'm trying to teach people in the business as well. Is they, and that's where that kind of coaching element of it, and where I know I can't do all the doing for the firm, and therefore I have to teach you know, procurement isn't complicated. Is it going to do me out of a job? Probably not, because there are still plenty of places you can add value. Will it help me be more successful? Yes. So I think the important thing when you're working with stakeholders is that you can facilitate that process for them. And they may, they may think that it's difficult. And yeah, there's elements that are time consuming, but the overall process can be made simpler. And I think, yeah, it's the role of procurement to make sure that we're facilitating that for them and being that sort of conduit between the supplier and the stakeholder and the internal processes to make sure that things happen in the, in a timely fashion can appear easy to the, to the stakeholders, but you know, there might be yep. a, a load of work going on in the background to, to get that to, to, to work really. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I, you know, for me, I sometimes do see myself as a voice of the supplier within the organization as well. You know, I think there is a certain amount of, you will get out of the supplier what you invest in them. And therefore, it's, if it's very transactional, you'll have a very transactional relationship. You know, and I suppose that's probably the, the one area where I am trying to push stakeholders a lot more of invest the time in the relationship. Even if you think it's a good relationship, you can always make it better. You know, and I suppose what when I meet suppliers for the first time that are working with us, I say, well, do you know our strategy as a firm? And I guess if they don't, then actually the state, their main stakeholder in the organization should probably be having a kind of a different conversation with them to know the strategy of the firm so they can see, well, therefore, me as a supplier, how am I going to help you deliver that? And suddenly it kind of, you get more value in and kind of more more outcome from that supplier really, just by being more open and sharing. With them, really. And I, I suppose that's probably the aspect that, People typically don't see the role of, or don't understand as the role of procurement. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's kind of one of the key areas where procurement can add a lot more value, really, bringing suppliers closer to the organization. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we see it in teams, don't we? You don't employ people and then not tell them the strategy and say, yeah. right, you, you've got to do this one very specific thing and this is what's in yeah. your employment contract and yeah, yeah, yeah. there's one item. But we do it with suppliers. It's uh, a good often. analogy. Really good yeah. analogy. That. Yeah. I like it. Might steal that. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free. Yeah. Finally, how can people get hold of you? Through LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. You know, I connect to a lot of people. You know, feel free to reach out. Uh, I try and kind of respond to people as much as possible. But you know, I used to be a JLR. There was hundreds of people in procurement, so I didn't really have a wide network. So our network was inside the organisation. Now that I'm outside of that. I'm very much trying to build that network and I love connecting to people wherever they are on their procurement journey, really. So if anybody's got questions, you can certainly find me there, connect to me um, and feel free to ask me a question through messaging as well. So Richard, thank you for joining us today and uh, yeah, talk to you later. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. Thanks for listening. Do like and share and subscribe to hear the next procurement conversation.